well, almost got a gap here, but not intentionally. Again, the naivete comes in into a play, and then this, this story is going to lead into how I ended up getting into teaching. I decided I wanted to go to grad school. I wanted to go get a PhD, but you know, I did not consult the faculty, even though there were several that I was pretty close to. I only applied to two schools, not at all factoring in the those schools might have lots of stellar applicants uh, who might be a better fit in terms of research interest than I might be. And I got rejected by both. Okay. And so I'm sitting there going, oh my God. Now, the way I got through high school was, was being a line cook at Mr. Steak. I was like, I'm back to Mr. Steak. <laughs> a line <laughs> cook at Mr. Steak. Way. It was another line. Unknown talents. If you ever need someone who can grill 30 steaks at once, I'm your man. You've just heard Wayne Whiten from the University of Nevada, Las Vegas. My podcast partner, Eric Landrum, interviewed Wayne for episode 150 of Psych Sessions, Conversations About Teaching and Stuff. Please stay tuned for so much more. The Psych Sessions podcast is sponsored by STP. That is the Society for the Teaching of Psychology. That's APA Division II. You can find them at teachpsych.org. The views or product endorsements expressed do not represent the views, support, or endorsements of STP. Psych Sessions is so grateful to have STP as a long-term supporter. You can make an impact with PsychLearn. PsychLearn from the American Psychological Association is a complete all digital instructional resource for psychology courses. PsychLearn drives deeper engagement than traditional printed textbooks, immersing students in multi-dimensional learning experiences with engaging content for practice and formative assessment. Structured around applied cognitive science, PsychLearn helps students gain confidence in their understanding of foundational concepts and builds toward critical learning outcomes. Research methods, introduction to social psychology, and statistics for the behavioral sciences are now available on the PsychLearn platform with more content to come. Please visit pl.apa.org forward slash sessions to find out more. That's plcyclern.apa.org forward slash sessions to find out more. The Psych Sessions podcast is brought to you by Macmillan Learning Psychology. Macmillan Learning's Achieve for Psychology, setting a whole new standard for integrating assessments, activities, and analytics into your teaching. One way Achieve does this is by offering exclusive digital activities for each title created by the author or authors. These immersive activities, each accompanied by assessments, engage students in the very essence of contemporary psychology as they role play as researcher, work with data, and learn to be critical thinkers. Experience these yourself and tell us what you think. See a preview and get involved at macmillanlearning.com forward slash psych sessions. Macmillan's Achieve for Psychology, engaging every student, supporting every instructor, setting the new standard for teaching and learning. This is a very special episode of Psych Sessions, conversations about teaching and stuff. I am here with Wayne Whiten from the University of Nevada, Las Vegas. Hi, Wayne. Hey, Eric. Good to see you. It's good to see you, too. And I'm so thrilled that you agreed to do this. I think we started talking about this way in the before times, the pre-pandemic, probably over a dinner at some conference, the pandemic hit. And then I, I, I almost fear that you thought I was like a stalker. I think Every six months to a year, I might have emailed and said, hey, want to do a podcast? Hey, want to do a podcast? Hey, hey. And, and so th thank you for agreeing to do this. Uh, well, you were very persistent, and I apologize for any reluctance that I display. But, uh, you know, I, I just uh, I'm sort of self-conscious about this kind of thing, and I wanted some time to reflect and, and uh, sort of find some preparation time before we sat down to talk. So well, I, I finally found it. 
I, gonna- I, I appreciate that. And it's, it's interesting. I mean, in some ways, how seriously you, you took that, maybe that'll be a theme that we come back to, because I'll bet that seriousness has paid off in your teaching and your writing. And, and I, I suspect we can come back to that in a bit. So speaking of teaching, are you, have you taught anything this past summer or in the middle of summer school or in the spring? What are, what are you teaching these days? Well, actually, uh, I've got a big surprise <laughs> in that I have finally retired from, from teaching as of this year. Okay. So when, when was the last, my last class? My last class was in the fall, teaching, uh, teaching of psychology. Okay. So you walked away for the last time in December then. Yeah. Yeah. Basically. Okay. And so, <laughs> wow. Yeah. Con- con- congratulations and condolences. <laughs> Both. Absolutely both. It's a bittersweet moment brought on in part by the pandemic and all the travel opportunities that were lost. And we'd like more flexibility. In fact, just yesterday, I booked a, a trip to, to Europe for uh, September, which obviously would not have been possible if I were, if I were teaching again in the, in the fall. So, uh, but it, it was, yeah, I mean, it's like, I just lesioned off a huge part of my identity and it does feel very weird. Very strange. Well, but it's been all of this is tentative. You know what? I mean, hey, a year or two goes by, I get to spend a lot of time in Europe and maybe I'll ask to get back into the classroom. Who knows? Okay. Well, there's, a, oh, there's so much there to unpack. So first off, thanks for sharing that. Second, you know, so many book authors, I think, keep their, what is it? Their foot in the pond, their finger in the dam. I don't know what the analogy would be because... They're revising their books, even if they're not in the classroom, they're still reading psych, they're revising, you know, they're, they're working on the revisions or the ancillaries. And so I suspect that if you're retiring from teaching, you're probably not retiring from authoring. Oh, no, 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 no. Yeah. So, I mean, so you're still going to be connected in that way, which probably means you're still going to conferences and giving talks. I will still be to conferences. Yeah. Yes, oh, absolutely. Yeah. Perhaps more than ever. Right. I mean, some of our colleagues in the last 10 years who have retired, and for our listeners, I'm doing air quotes, you know, retired to start doing more things <laughs> in terms of projects. I'm thinking of, you know, people like the Drew Applebee's of the world, you know, who who retired and started writing more and wanted to be more Mm -hmm. task force, Mm -hmm. which is great. But, you know, so yeah, you might have more time to do more things, more things in psych and obviously out of psych. Yeah. I I wouldn't be shocked if it worked out. It certainly seems to work out that way for a lot of other people. They, they seem to actually kick up their productivity in some respects. So yeah. And and I, we'll make it to it a little bit later, but do you enjoy teaching online or do you really just crave the face to face? I prefer face to face. I mean, okay. I, I couldn't have told you that until the last two years because I, I had not taught online previously, and we did it all over Zoom, and it was fine. But I, I missed, I missed in person. It's just way more spontaneity, way more give and take, yeah, no. and uh, way more engagement on the part of the students. Sure. And I was going to say, you know, if two years from now you're hankering to get back in the classroom, you understand that you could teach an online intro psych. For any college or university in the nation, you get that, right? <laughs> well, I mean, geographically, that may be true. I don't know how many of them would have me, but oh, I get the point about ge- geography being no longer being the barrier it once was. Right. I mean, and I, I understand I can't speak for all institutions in the country. I guarantee you want to teach an online intro psych at Boise State University. Let's see, a new in- adjunct instructor for all of $3,300 for a three, three credit <laughs> course, you know, I think that might be tip money on your trip to Europe. <laughs> Wayne, we'll talk to you whenever you're ready. <laughs> well, all right, but to back up, I, I did want to elaborate a little bit on, on yep, please, because I taught at and, and the, how different they are. I have really, I think that's sort of what's interesting in terms of my career trajectory. Yeah. I taught at three radically in three radically different institutional settings. I mean, so I began my career in the Illinois community college system and, and that was bad. So that was like almost the first 20 years of my career. And I enjoyed that immensely. I mean, I, I don't know today. I don't know that people can appreciate it, but at that time, 
community colleges were brand new. I mean, there've been a handful of two-year schools around the country, but this was a movement and people were passionate about it. And it was, it was a, a time and a place where there was a lot of innovation going on. People were open to innovation. We were trying to sort of reinvent how to, to, to teach the first couple of years of college. And uh, it was, it was great fun, but that was one environment. You know, and then I moved on to Santa Clara University, Mount California, and, and that was a very elite private school. I mean, I didn't fully appreciate how elite selected they were until I got there, but uh, their, their students were highly motivated, uniformly bright. They almost scared me sometimes. They were so motivated, but I, I, I really loved that as well. I mean, it, it was, they had a really, really strong social justice uh, kind of emphasis in mm-hmm. school. I think in large part because of the, the Jesuit connection. Sure. And I came to really adore and appreciate Jesuit's contribution to education in our, in our country. And so that was, you know, just a, a, another radically different environment. And then starting in 2002, I came to UNLV, which is your classic flagship state university, became an R1, you know, in the last decade or so, very diverse student body. And there, of course, the, the charming thing for me. I mean, I continued teaching intro and, and social at the undergraduate level, but starting like 17 years ago, I got to take over the teaching of psychology course with the grad students. So that, that was my first opportunity to work with PhD students, which again, was just a whole other ball game for me. And I found very gratifying and, and, and very interesting. And so, yeah, so I've been teaching, that's what my main thing is teaching the, the teaching of psychology course since I think it was 2004, maybe 2005, I'm not sure. So you had two 20 year careers, one at DePage, one at UNLV, and how long at Santa Clara? The nineties, basically, I think nine years. Well, you, okay, so I, I did the math wrong. You, Cause you, you haven't been teaching for 49 years. 50, took a couple of years off in there. I started no, in 1972. Wait, wait, you, you didn't start teaching when you were nine years old. Come on, man. Well, that's one of the part of the upcoming story. <laughs> okay. <laughs> so well, I got into teaching, but it, it, it did happen at a very abnormally early age. I just got to wrap my head around 50. Yeah. If you've been doing it for 50 years and you've just stepped away. So did you know in the fall that that was your last semester teaching? I didn't know going in, but as the semester wore on, I was, I was thinking about it. And a lot of it is pandemic related. It was the pandem- you know, I kept thinking, you know, I, 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 I go, yeah, maybe pandemic is going to peter out. No, that would be right. a bad scenario, which with completely different implications. But that hasn't been the case. And so, uh, no, nah, it's something I kind of made a decision on the fly last, last fall, but I, I was certainly thinking about it fourth fall. But by the end of the semester, you, you had the notion that th- this is my last semester for, for right now. My intention is this is my last yeah. semester in the classroom. Mm-hmm. And, and did you, d- did you invite dear friends? Did you invite your wife to come to your last lecture? I mean, or, or did you just kind of go cold and just, you just did it like it was a regular day? No, I, well, first of all, it was all on Zoom. <laughs> oh, oh, it wasn't face to face. advising anybody. Oh, shoot. And uh, no, no, uh, I, I did not mention it to the class. I went and talked to the department chair, I don't know, maybe a month or so, maybe six weeks before the end of the uh, semester and, and, and let him know and, uh, and asked him if I should say anything to the class and he said, nah, nah, let it go for now. So. So I just, just let it. Yeah. You know, it's, it's really a shame as much as you enjoyed face-to-face teaching that you couldn't go out that last semester, that last week face-to-face. That, no, that's true. Absolutely. Yeah. That, you know, whoever your, your best colleagues on campus were or family members who could have been there, who could have sat in the back of the auditorium and just kind of been there for, you know, and, you know, I don't know if your campus does this, but we occasionally have a last lecture series. You know, what would you tell students if you're giving your last lecture? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. We'll have either faculty members about to retire or who have retired come back and give that. That that would be fun to to hear you give that. 
So mm-hmm. I'll try to talk you into that at some point in time. So you, t- you told me a little bit about your chronology academically. If you'll permit me, or maybe you won't permit me, I don't know. You know, for me to permit me to go even further back. So did mom and dad go to college when you were growing up? Was it, I, this is a question I ask all the time. Was it going to be what college are you going to go to? Or was it going to be what college? Do you have siblings? Did they go to college? How much, whatever you're willing to share, if anything, there. Well, like yourself, I grew up in the Chicago area. That's, I'm remembering correctly, right? Wow. Yes. I'm, I'm, I'm honored. And like yourself, I headed downstate for college. So we'd have some similarities. In my case, I grew up in, in Aurora, which is, a, sure. you know, when I was a kid, it was like a, a city of about 65,000 that really didn't consider it a self suburb quite yet of Chicago, but, but the suburbs grew out and, and, and swallowed it up. So there, it certainly is a suburb now. My father was a carpenter. My mother was a homemaker, no college for either one of them. In fact, my father had to drop out of high school to, after a sophomore year to, to help out with the finances. He came from a family of 13 children and, and they, they all needed to work as soon as they were capable of that. Four siblings, two brothers, two sisters. As for the question about, is it, was it a question of, of whether I'll go to college or which college it'll be? It was, there was never any question I wanted to go to college. Okay. But uh, there was no expectation of that whatsoever in our household and, and really no way to finance it really. So the question I faced was how the heck am I going to go to college? Mm -hmm. How am I going to get anybody to accept me? Cause I knew nothing about the process and uh, how in God's name will, will I ever pay for it? So, so that was my situation. So I, I came, I came from the most wholesome, loving, supportive family on the planet. So there, there's I have nothing to, to, you know write about in that regard whatsoever, but college was born to them. And uh, so I was a true first gen student who had right, no idea right. how to navigate that. And, and I just sort of did it by the, the seat of my pants. Now, what uh, the, the big break for me was, I, uh, you're, I'm sure familiar with this coming from Illinois. I ended up getting an Illinois state scholarship, which as you know, is not that exclusive by any means, no big deal. I didn't know they existed. Until it showed up in my mailbox, you know, one day I got the mailbox and I got this thing that says, they'll pay for my tuition up to X number of dollars or something. And I, I, I guess it was kind of neat based. So it was, it was, it actually covered all of tuition at, at the private school that I went to. Wow. And so that's how I, 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 I managed to swing it was it, it's been after that Illinois state scholarship. I don't know what I, I would have done. So Wayne, in five siblings altogether, where were you in the birth order? I was the oldest. Wow, you're the oldest. So obviously, well, I shouldn't say obviously. For, first to go to college. Yes, yeah. Of the five, I feel like showed you that there wasn't any pressure to go to college in this environment. I only have one sibling who who went on and got a, a college degree. Yeah, what? Well, so they're all they're all very bright. I mean, they right. Right. Breeze through college. Right. Uh, yeah. I mean, we both know plenty of people very bright who who go on for fantastic careers who don't have to go to college, both back then and today. Right. Mm-hmm. Absolutely. What, what's the age gap between you and the other four, if you don't mind? We were about four year intervals roughly until, until my youngest sister. So gotcha. 17 years total between myself and my youngest sister. Gotcha. Okay. All right. When you were, did you just apply to one college to go to, or did you apply to a, a bunch of private schools in Illinois? I didn't have enough. <laughs> I'm naive. I knew nothing. Oh, okay. No, no. I, I just applied to Bradley and to U of I, but U of I scared me. It was, it was just too too large, too intense. You no, know, I'm not trying to compliment myself, but in some really f- phenomenal ways, our paths are pretty parallel. I mm-hmm. applied to two schools, one private and the U of I. So mm-hmm. mine was Monmouth College and mm-hmm. not Bradley. No, I remember private that. Liberal Arts. And U of I. And when you went, when you got to Bradley, did you start off majoring in psychology or what's the story there? No, I, I went to Bradley thinking I wanted to be an attorney. Thinking I'd be a go to law school. Not sure why I thought I wanted to go to law school. I don't remember really any motivation, but again, I I just working for total naivete. So that sounded good in theory. And so I, I. Was planning on pre law and, and political science. I was, I was kind of political at the time. And freshman year, 
I had uh, introduction to political science and introduction to psychology and introduction to political science had a very, and, and they both occurred in the exact same theater like room that held about 250 freshmen, but both the courses did. And, and the inter, intro to political science had a very charismatic instructor who was very, very lively. And the course bored me into tears. <laughs> it's just, I mean, he, he was interesting, but the subject matter. God, did it bore me. Whereas with psychology, I mean, it was teen taught by the entire department. Some of the instructors were very charismatic and some were not. And the book I, I learned later was, it was Kendler, Howard Kendler, which was a good, solid, reputable book, but dry as hell. And yet in spite of those disadvantages, I loved psychology. I just found it fascinating. And uh, so at the end of the year, I switched from pre-law political science to pre-law psychology. I'm still planning on going to law school. And then at the end of junior year, I happened to pick up something in a bookstore randomly, a book called The Lawyers. And I now know it was really a hatchet job on the legal profession, but it was a really horribly negative profile of, of law as a profession. I decided they were all unethical and I wanted nothing to do. <laughs> and again. What a bucket, you know, I mean, if I had any, but, but, but you're, you're, being, you're being too hard on yourself, but okay, it's your story. I'll, I'll let you tell it. So anyway, I decided forget law school. And so then I decided I'd, I'd go on in, in psychology. The, the Howard Kendler book, I think I've seen it, but it, it's like a tomb, right? I mean, it's, it's all text, no, no photos, no, I mean, it's like a, it's almost like a history of psychology type textbook. Yeah, very much so. Yeah. But that's interesting. The power of the instructors bringing it to life. And wow, the department team teaching it. I've heard of that model where everybody comes in and does two weeks on their yeah, day. Pretty- and that's a, that's a tough model. Yeah, I think they abandoned it like four, five, six years later. I, but- yeah, I, I, I can get it. So, so... Gra- you, did you graduate with the double major? No, no, just just psychology. Okay. And did you get excited about research as an undergrad at Bradley? Did you did you go to MPA? Did you were you involved in psychi? What kind of what kind of undergrad were you? Well, you know, I mean, I got into psych. I, I, actually, I, I really spread things around. I mean, I, I really what I liked about Bradley was it was big enough that you're still meeting people like when you're still a senior, but, but small enough that you could, you could experiment with a lot of different things. So, I mean, I didn't just focus in a narrow way on, on psychology. Mm-hmm. And I, one year I did the debate team. One year I wrote for the newspaper throughout my stay there. I was on the radio station doing music shows and I became news and sports director and, and did play by play Bradley basketball on the radio. That's awesome. Which, and well, here's the cool part. My mentor, a student who was a year ahead of me, went on to fame and fortune as, as, a, as a sports broadcaster. He uh, went on to become the voice of the Yankees and the voice of the Dodgers. Can you believe wow. that? Wow. You're not talking about... Why is that a big sportscaster were quickly dashed by the fact that he was 10 times as good as I was? You're not talking about Vin Scully. No, no, no. Charlie Steiner. Oh, okay. I've, I know that name. The radio, radio voice of the Yankees. He had a, a 10 or 15 year career at ESPN. He's still the voice of the radio voice of the Dodgers. Wow. You know, so, I yeah. I got to do a lot of different things. And, and so, no, we, I don't recall. <sighs> there were a couple of faculty, I think, who took people to, to MPA for Bradley, but not anyone that I was working with, or at least not at that time. So I did not go as an undergrad to any conferences. I did get started my senior year with Claire Retog getting involved in, in, in research. And that was kind of a little late in terms of the, uh, the grad school application process. So did you take a gap year or did you know you wanted to go to grad school? Did you get a, get a, a real job as some people say, what, what, what happened after you graduated? Uh, well. Almost got a gap year, but not intentionally. Again, the naivete comes in into a play, and then this this story is going to lead into how I ended up getting into teaching very prematurely. I decided I wanted to go to grad school, I wanted to go get a PhD, but you know, I did not consult the faculty, even though there were several that I was pretty close to. I, I don't know what I was thinking. I only applied to two schools, 
not at all factoring in no. that those schools might have lots of stellar applicants uh, who might be a better fit, you know, in terms of research interest than I might be. And I got rejected by both. Okay. And so I'm sitting there going, oh my God. Now, the way I got through high school was, was being a line cook at Mr. Steak. I was like, I'm back to Mr. Steak. <laughs> a line <laughs> cook at Mr. Steak. Way, you want to know my unknown talents. If you ever need someone who can grill 30 steaks at once, I'm your man. Hey. Uh, so anyway, I was devastated because I had no plan B, no plan B whatsoever. So, you know, I applied to two schools, excellent schools on my day. I wasn't thinking about a safety school. I wasn't thinking, but they were both far away too. There was no way on earth I had the money to move to these places. So, I mean, this was like the worst plan in history. <laughs> I was reflecting on this the other day. I am seriously introverted. And I'm going to move across the country to someplace where I know no one. I mean, I don't know. But, but maybe that's the introvert's dream, right? You know no one there. So no one will talk to okay. you. Yet. All right. I guess that might have worked. So anyway, I, I was devastated. When, when these, these two wonderful institutions declined my interest in joining their PhD program. So I went to, to Claire Eta, who I've been working on some research with, explained to her. And she, she said, well, you know what? We have a master's program, which you know, I, I did it. And, and she said, we certainly haven't filled all our spots. We can certainly take you into our master's program. And I said, deal, <laughs> I accept. And uh, so that's how I ended up pursuing an MA at, at Bradley. And so, uh, so Claire, but Claire, knowing that you were her student, hadn't talked to you about, I mean, just didn't do the natural mentoring thing. Hey, where are you applying? I had spread myself out too thinly. I mean, I, my first real exposure to Claire was senior year. Gotcha. So I had really worked more with other people and, okay. and it was my fault but I didn't go and, and talk to them. But I, I had, had several people that I thought I was, that I was close to, but I foolishly did not consult them. Well, okay. So wait, wait, now here's where I get myself in trouble. I, I shouldn't really argue with you or try to correct you. I, I don't, I don't think it was foolish. I just think you were a first gen college student. It's not that you foolishly made an error. You just, you just didn't know what to do. Well, no, that's true. And a lot of it was naive day. I'll grant you that. Although the not going to talk to people that I was friendly with and who had expertise was stupid. That part, that part was stupid. Oh, but, but it's, but that hindsight, but wait, oh, but that, that hindsight's 2020 though, right? It, well, all right. True. True. I mean, when you're, when you're in it, it, it's hard to know what to do perfectly, but it, it is your story, you know? When I hear Bill McKeechee say things like, I was just lucky, it's like, Bill, you worked your butt off for 60 years. You know, applications didn't fall into your lap by accident. You know, it wasn't just luck. I mean, anyway, I'll stop. So, so you're, you were on the route to telling me how you got into teaching, how you got into higher ed. Well, yeah, and it doesn't take long. It only takes a month from the... <laughs> It's a really weird story. So uh, come fall, I started in the master's program at, at Bradley. And one month or maybe six weeks into the semester, there's a nearby community college called Illinois Central College. And uh, they call up the department head in, in site. And they explain to him that we just promoted one of our psych faculty into an administrative position. Just got the promotion literally yesterday. And... He needs to drop two of his sections of intro site out of the five that he's teaching. So, I mean, he's just not dropping them all at once, but he, he needs to drop two of his sections and it's their daytime sections. So there are not a lot of people floating around who can pick up daytime sections in the, in the middle of a semester. Do you have anybody among your graduate students who could perhaps come in and pick up these two sections of intro production to psychology? And uh, the department chair put a little note in my box, come see me. And he, he told him, well, yeah, he said, yes, I, I think I've got something I can say. But, so at that point, you don't have your master's yet. I've only got one month to grad school, <laughs> maybe six weeks. I don't recall exactly. So are you 22 years old? Not yet. I, I, well, 
I don't know. I don't remember exactly when it was. I, I turned 22 in late September, so I might have been 21. Oh my and, God, you're uh, a 21-year-old with your bachelor's degree teaching two sections of intro psych. I one weekend's notice. But, <laughs> I know, I know, I know. It was a little crazy. Isn't this a Netflix horror flick? <laughs> oh my gosh. What not to do to a teacher? Here's why it's not a Netflix horror flick. So, all right. So, I went on one weekend morning, I went in the following Tuesday and, and you know, I just scrambled all weekend to create lectures out of, out of nowhere, out of nothing, using two intro psych books that I could find around, you know, from all my various roommates. So, I had the one that I had, I had one other that somebody else had. And I pieced together lectures. I was only staying like a day out of the, the class. Yep. But I, I walked into that classroom and it was joy from the first moment. It was just like, this is so much fun. I mean, I, I found out that I really loved looking into all this stuff and figuring out how to organize it and explain it and, and make sense out of it and come up with concrete examples and and just, just even creating the lectures, I just thrived on that. And then when I got in the classroom, I, I just enjoyed it so much that it was, it was like a revelatory experience where, I mean, two weeks into the semester or two weeks into my teaching, I'm going, this is what I do. God, I love this. All right. So where did that come from? This is the young man who didn't know anything about college systems or graduate school processes who all of a sudden finds his calling that's going to follow him for 50 years. Where does Dr. Whiten, where does that come from? Well, I sat through a lot of classes. <laughs> yeah, but that doesn't mean you're going to have joy in doing it yourself on 48 hours notice. No, no, that was a surprise. I, I, I didn't anticipate that. Obviously, I said yes, because, wow, I could use money. <laughs> sure. And, and, uh, I said, yes, because yeah, I'll figure it out. I'll figure out a way to make this happen. And uh, what I didn't anticipate was just the sheer joy that I experienced in, in doing it. I mean, obviously I was doing it incompetently or borderline competently at best, but, but I sure found it to be fun. Well, that's what you know. don't, don't we all do that? I mean, I've told this story on other recordings, you know, my first time teaching intro psych. I found the very best textbook I thought was available at the time, and I did not adopt it for my class. I kept it for my lecture notes, and then I adopted some other book for them, but I kept the best, clearest book for myself. I am not kidding. I am not making that up. That is absolute truth. <laughs> oh, 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 I had not heard that one. All right. That's, that's fascinating. And that, that, that may be borderline ethical violation. I don't know, but. That, that is the truth. Mm -hmm. So, so you were, you were hooked from almost day one, if not day one. Yeah, kind of. And it, it just came out of nowhere. Well, do you have any recollection what year that was? Well, 1972, the fall of 72. 72. Well, damn, you're right. You're, you're a semester short of 50 years, aren't you? Or you're a semester more than 50 years. I'd have to no, I'm not going to dive back and check for sure, but it's, it's right around 50 you're, years. You're, yeah. 72 to 22 is, is 50 years. My goodness. So was it the newness of teaching that drew you to STP and Society for Teaching of Psychology? All right. STP was, that all came from Mac. So do you want to talk and about our, our books? listeners may not have any idea Mac Top. Pardon me? We're talking about books first or Mac Top? Well, all right. Actually, I did get a book done before I got booked on Mac Top. So I, I, let me back up. Let me back up. Okay. So, I, mean, I, guess, I guess the end of this story is this is sort of how I ended up in the community college system instead of going directly in for a PhD. I, I, I taught all that year at, at Illinois Central College, and I loved it. And I made clear to them that I was interested in a opening if they have one. They They took a while to figure that out. So I also applied to another college, another central Illinois community college, Lincoln Lab Community College. Oh, sure. It's good. And uh, I had no idea if I'd be able to get a job. So I also did apply for PhD programs. And this time I was a little more crafty. 
And uh, and you were earning your masters along the way. True, true. And so uh, I got into PhD programs, and the one I was going to go to if I did not get a job was Washington University in, in St. Louis. Awesome. Woo. Yeah, that, that would have been. And I often reflect on, wow, how things might have been different if I had. But, uh, but I did uh, I did land a job at, at eventually in both Lincoln Land and, and Illinois Central off of me, teaching positions. And I went with Lincoln Land because they offered 50% higher salary, which was only $12,000 But you calculate what, what ICC was. So uh, I went on to Springfield for two years and taught at Lincoln Land. So that was my first full-time experiences as a community college. And what, what's Lincoln Land called today? I think it's still Lincoln Land. Is it really? Oh, okay. I think, so. I think so. It's down in the, it's in the Springfield area, down by Lake Springfield and all these places. That's the interesting thing about being a community college is back then. They were all just building out their campus. I right. got at Lincoln Land when I first showed up. We were in Quonset huts where sometimes people broke through the floor. It was, it was you know, rotting away. Wow. It was so cheaply made. But, but you know, second semester, we moved into a really nice campus. And I enjoyed the two years there. Problem was, there was no way to, to pursue a PhD while, you know, in Springfield. So, uh, so then I started looking around for a community college in Chicago. And uh, managed, after two years at Lincoln Land, I managed to, to land that, that college page. And so, so, you, so you started at DuPage and you worked on your PhD at the same time. Yes. I started at DuPage in 75 and then I, I, I didn't even go through the normal application process. I just like, well, I guess I'm, I don't know. I reached out to, all right. So there were six PhD programs in Chicago, but, but three of them were too far to drive. I mean, there was just no way on earth, like, you know, Chicago, right? There's no way I was going to do Western suburbs working full time and do Northwestern. That was just physical impossibility. And so I reached out to DePaul and the University of Illinois, Chicago, and inquired if, you know, set them my information and inquired whether they might be willing to allow me to continue teaching full-time at DuPage and, you know, go through their PhD program. And then they both said yes, amazingly. So, so I ended up at uh, University of Illinois. UIC. Uh, University of Illinois, Chicago Circle at the time. Yeah. It was, oh, Circle. Yeah. Okay. Gotcha. So, th so that's, that's why I couldn't figure out the math earlier. That that's why I was shocked at 50 years. Yeah. But you did masters and d doctoral work the same time you were teaching. Your teaching career was going on the same time as you're, as you're gaining your education. Mm -hmm. So does what? that, does that help explain why you've been so prolific as a writer? You've always multitasked. Well, it certainly hasn't hurt, I'm sure. Yeah, and I, I, I know other people. I didn't learn to keep a lot of uh, balls in the air. <sighs> so, yeah, I think back now it's crazy. I mean, a full time load of community college, yeah. fifteen hours, and I actually taught an overload every semester. So I, I was actually doing twenty hours. Of course, you did, and, and then and worked on the PhD at, at the same time. So, and you probably did a few extra projects here and there for faculty members. Because you wanted to have some extra research exposure or because somebody asked you and you were eager and you made the time because that's who you were. Faculty members figured out who they could count on. I wouldn't be surprised. I'm sorry, Wayne. I'm just trying to, I, 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 just, I just have to interject a massive thank you to, to Harry Upshaw at the University of Illinois who was willing to, to take me on. He, uh, apparently there was some pushback. I learned like two years into the program. Parvin wasn't entirely keen on you doing this, but uh, one of the young faculty shared this with me later, but uh, Harry had been a former head of the department and he, his, his, his confidence carried a lot of weight. And so then he decided to, to let me try. But we, I think they tell graduate students, we prefer you not have a full-time job. They want your graduate work to be your full-time job, right? Yes, of course. Of and course. and I, I get that. And, but at the same time that you did it and did it successfully, you know, post hoc confirmed his confidence in you that you could do it and you didn't let them down. And, and probably, you probably paved the way for the next student who came along and said, I want to work full-time while attending this program. Well. That Wayne Whiten guy did it. You probably can too. Let's give him a chance. Let's give her a chance or whatever. Absolutely. 
So, and I, I've, I've kind of either asked you in dinner conversation or in writing or in email correspondence, you started doing research about intro psych. And I know we're going to talk about textbooks at some point, and this kind of gets us there a little bit. So you, you wrote some really cool stuff, late eighties, early nineties, and you had a, what I think still to this day is an influential textbook chapter with Randall White about intro site textbooks. When you started doing that research, were you like, I'm just interested in this topic because I teach the class. I want to know, or was it, I have an idea to write a textbook and this is going to be a good foundation or was it just serendipitous or do you remember the timeline or how that came together? Yeah, I, I could, I can answer the question easily. For some, I don't know why, not quite sure how to explain this, but from the moment I got involved in teaching, I became a shameless fanboy of textbooks. I just, you know, that, that when I learned that they would roll in for free, <laughs> I would go to, go to FPA and just say, send me that one, that one, and that one, <laughs> you know? It was just like, whoa, <laughs> my God, this is so cool. And so I ordered everything. I taught everything, so I could order everything. And I, so I was just a, 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 a hopeless fanboy for, for textbooks. A new, a new textbook would roll in, you know, come in via mail and, and, and show up in the mailbox. And I, I just, I'd savor it. I'd study it. I'd look it over. I mean, and I'd, and I'd find a, a, a wonderful place on my bookshelf for it. I'd go back to it. I mean, I just, I just had this thing for textbooks. I don't know why. And so I was always interested in, um, and so it was a, just an interest in textbooks that, that drove the, yeah. uh, the, the interest in doing some research on textbooks. And yep. then getting into authorship kind of sort of made that research peter out because it sort of felt a little weird. Well, I, I understand that. I mean, someone, I mean, first off, you're going to get criticized no matter what. So we know that, but yeah. someone could have come along and said, well, you're doing the research to further your textbook. Well, you, you're also publishing that research. Anybody can come along and use it for their textbook. It's not like you kept it proprietary. It, it's interesting that you, you fanboy geek out on books. Were there, were there books at that time that you remember either intro psych or others that you just really went, Oh my gosh, this is really, this really hit home with my students or this really hit home with me in graduate school or are there any oh, standouts no. for you? I, I wouldn't even know where to start if I start reminiscing okay. about textbooks okay. that I loved. I mean, and you I, know, I, our, the rest of the interview. Our, our, our listeners can't see this, but, you know, I was presuming Wayne's in his home office and he's sitting in front of a bunch of fake books, a fake bookshelf with hundreds of books behind him. You know, these fake things you can buy from Amazon where they're, they're just cardboard cutouts. I, I think he does love his books. He's probably got dozens of those bookshelves throughout the house and the, in the, in the home. So your interest I textbook was not the first textbook that you wrote. Is that correct? That is correct. So can you tell our listeners about the psychology of adjustment? I can. I think it's, it's another sort of cute story. I mean, it's, 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 it's just like the teaching thing. It's just weird how I, I, I got into the, the writing. So I'm teaching at DuPage and I've been teaching the adjustment course now for five years. It's 1978. And back in those days, sales reps were all around the campuses of schools, vastly more so than today and vastly more of them because there were 20 publishers publishing in, in psychology at that time. And so this gentleman comes in from West Publishing, sales rep, 1978. And now a lot of my colleagues didn't really like talking to the sales reps. They, they thought it was a real pain in the butt. But being the textbook fanboy that I was, I talked to them all day. They just sent me more books, you know? <laughs> so, so I welcomed them with open arms. And, and that was so unusual. <laughs> they, they, so they kind of like that. So anyway, this rep was selling a new adjustment textbook. And so he went through his spiel about how this is going to be a great adjustment textbook. And I, I, I'm sure I told him something like, well, I'll, I'll certainly take a look at it. 
when I launched it, what probably was a six, seven, eight minute monologue, what is wrong with all the adjustment te textbooks that are out there today? Because um, I mean, I looked and studied all 20 or 25 of them and I had problems with each and every one. And that was a course you were already teaching? Yeah, I, I was, that, I, that's, that was the first course I was hired to teach at Lincoln Land was, was adjustment. That's, they wanted somebody to cover adjustment. And that, of course, I did intro as well. And Wayne, is that your specialty area? Well, it's not really, it's, it's really like calling intro your specialty area, but, okay. but I, I was willing to teach it. I, I'd had the course as an undergrad, a really good version of the course, and I felt comfy with it. And so, yeah, I sold myself as being able to teach adjustment at, at Lincoln Land. And then when okay. I moved out of the page, they had the course and although they brought me in there, they were trying to cover child development at that time, which I, I taught to them a lot. I also picked up the adjustment. Okay. And I've been teaching it for five years and had some very strong opinions on, on, on the books, which I, I thought were collectively getting dated and too easy and too soft and, and I could go on and on, but again, that would bore everyone into oblivion. But anyway, so I, I do this like monologue about the adjustment textbooks and this, this rep looks at me and, and says something to the effect, I, I don't, can't say it, I remember precisely, he says, if you're that unhappy with all the books out there, realize you can write your own. And there it is. I was stunned to hear those words. I mean, they're just utterly, utterly, utterly stunned. The thought had not really ever occurred to me. I, I, I probably looked at him like there were tentacles growing out of his head all of a sudden or something. I mean, I was that surprised. And, and I didn't know, wait, 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 wait a minute, wait a minute. I mean, I said, look, I, I thought that writing textbooks was the privilege of, of successful professors who, first of all, have their PhD, unlike me, <laughs> and secondly, are teaching at, at prestigious institutions. And, and have years of experience, you're telling me that I could write a book and, and you wouldn't throw it out just immediately. And, and his response was, well, you know what? I mean, you're mostly right. I mean, most textbook authors are, are, you know, at prestigious four year schools and yeah, a lot of them are, are very accomplished researchers, but, but we have published people out of community colleges and we've had some successful books that way. And so it is possible or what wow okay that, that's giving me food for thought and oh i went home and started working on it oh did he the best that you write for him for his company well he suggested they would certainly be interested okay all right so uh, i started researching how you go about that i managed to find a couple of books that were written on how to write a textbook because I had no one to really talk to about it. So I, I read up on it and, and then got to work on it. And over the next six to eight months, I said, yeah, I'll write an adjustment textbook. Sounds like fun. <laughs> so I, over the next six to eight months, I, I put together a prospectus and I wrote two sample chapters, as they said, you should do. And, yeah. uh, and then I, you know, compiled a list of five publishers to send it to. And I compiled the second list to buy because I assumed, you know, I, I thought it was like journal articles. I thought the rejection rate would be 90%. And uh, so I, I assumed, uh, you know, very high probability that no one would be interested. And so I set off this package to uh, five publishers that I thought might be able to use uh, an adjustment textbook. And uh, with not a lot in the way of high expectations, I, I, I might add. And again, surprise, surprise, you just never know what, what's going to happen, but all five quickly got back to me expressing an interest in, in publishing it. And I'm assuming West was one of those five that you sent it to. Yeah, West was one of the five. Yeah. So th this may be jumping ahead way too far. Wayne, is there ever a point in your life that you can identify where you overcame your imposter phenomenon? No, I'm still going through it like everybody else. Oh man, I was hoping... You had an epiphany moment. I'm sorry. <laughs> because wouldn't that have been it? You send off the five. You've got a back. So, I mean, the, the, humi the humility award of the year, you've got it, right? I mean, no one's, no one's going to. No, I, I, I disagree. With all due respect, you're wrong, right? You've prepared this prospectus 
you, you've never done it before in your life. You find two books. How, okay, how adorable is that, really? What year, 1979, what is it? You find two books on how to write a book. You write a prospectus. You send it off, and five publishers tell you they're interested? That wouldn't happen today. It, it might well, not even happen to you with your name. Another story. But What's that? That would not happen today. And I, I, that's something I want to discuss later, but yeah, but oh my gosh, you would, you would think that after that, your imposter phenomenon would at least have start a syndrome would have started to fade a little bit, but it, it's okay. Hell, I still didn't have a PhD. <laughs> I mean, my God. But it was pretty clear you didn't need it. <laughs> would, would it have gotten you a better contract or a better deal? I have no idea. I but did, did you sign with West? So I had the luxury, obviously, since all five of them wanted it, I had the luxury of, of uh, you know, being selective and talking to each one of them at length about, about, you know, how I would fit in with their other adjustment books and, you know, and I, I, I figured out that the thing to do is grill them on how excited they are about the book and, and how much they're going to, you know, kind of put into it and so forth. And West finished maybe third out of the, the, the five, the, the last two were Brooks Cole and Addison Wesley. Yeah, I haven't heard those names in a while. Yeah, those are, yeah, I know they don't even exist. They've all been folded into, into uh, you know, international conglomerates. Right. But so those were my final two. I really love both editors, but I especially love the editor from Brooks Cole. What is Brooks Cole? Yeah, yeah. And, and who uh, did they become? Thompson. They did. Yes, they. If Brooks Cole and Wadsworth were only sister companies, and then they. Finally began to sort of, and back at this time, they competed. And they competed still through the 1980s, the editorial departments did. But, but then when Thompson bought the two of them, they, they, they kind of combined them and started buying up other companies like Southwestern. And so Thompson is one that grew them into a conglomerate. And then Thompson, of course, sold off to some of the leverage buyout firm that, that set and uh, renamed to Cengage. And of course, they, they ended up bankrupt. <laughs> that was a whole other story. So. But now, now the adjustment book is under the Sun Gauge banner. Yes, yes. Going into its thirteenth edition. Third. That's a like. Leg- that's a legacy right there. I mean, getting a book. First off, getting the book published is amazing. Getting into its second edition is a real accomplishment. But thirteen is an unheard of. Seriously. Yet. Yeah. At the time, I thought just getting it written would be an accomplishment. Well, yeah, it's very it's, yes, exactly. Right. But I mean, after I signed the contract, I'm going, what the hell were you thinking? I have committed to having this book written. Well, okay, yeah, sorry. <laughs> it's not a time. Even in my world, I've had that experience where you think the hard work's the prospectus, and then you go, oh, <clears throat> now I got to write the damn thing. But yeah, no, it, it, it went on to, uh, to be, uh, you know, obviously pretty successful and, and, now is going into his 13th edition with two marvelous co-authors and the persons of Bob Dana Dunn and, and Elizabeth Hammer. And so I think it has a very, very bright future and hopefully it'll see 20 editions. We'll see. That, that, that is awesome. That is awesome. So was there something specific you wanted to share that what you learned from that? You know, just maybe a, a brief ode to, to uh, the editor signed me, Claire Verdoyne. I mean, uh, she, she took me under her arm, so to speak, and really taught me about, about publishing. It was, it was, it was, oh, so enlightening. I mean, she, she, she was older uh, in comparison to me anyway, to older lady, well, in comparison to all the other editors. Like her fellow editors, Brooks Cole, called her mother publisher. She was probably in her late fifties, <laughs> and uh, she kind of adopted me. And every year at MPA and MPA, we would have lengthy dinners where I would just just grill her for information on on the craft of publishing, textbook publishing in particular, and uh, got an incredible education. She was just a, a a darling to do that. Probably, you know. Probably did some of a disservice to her employer in terms of all the things she, she shared with me, but uh, she was just a wonderful woman to whom I'm deeply indebted and uh, all her, for her educating me on, on the, the intricacies and dynamics of textbook publishing. How does, so d- does this success kind of lead you to start thinking about an intro psych venture? How does MacTop fit in? Does STP start to come into play? I know. Th- I've heard a themes and variations story from Jane Hallinan 
I think I've heard it from you over dinner, but I, I'd love at some point for you to fit that in to our conversation as well. Oh, absolutely. Well, right, let's, let's talk Mac talk. Cause that, that's, that's something else that deserves its, its, its uh, yes. recognition. That is how I get started with, with STP. MacTop was the Mid-America Conference for Teachers of Psychology, founded, I think, in like 1984 by Joe Palladino at uh, University of Southern Indiana in, in Adamsville. And I did not attend the first year, but second year, I, I definitely headed down in, I think, 85, that would have been. And it, again, it was, I, I, I'm overusing this word, but it was, it was a, a kind of a revelatory experience coming together with all these faculty who were so passionate about teaching. I mean, I, I had a lot of colleagues at DuPage who were passionate too, but we were a small group. This is, you know, 80, 90 people getting together that, that are, are just so hardworking, so dedicated, so creative. And uh, so Paladino, I think really uh, you know, deserves a lot of credit for, for putting that together. And it became a model. These, these conferences based on this model started popping up all over the country. And so he, he created that model and, and, and deserves credit for that. But in terms of how that translated into STP, it brought me together on an annual basis with a incredible array of people who were already active in STP or who soon became active. That's in, right. Well, it wasn't even STP then, I, I should have, but in Division Two of APA. So, hey, for instance, at, at MacTop was the first place that I met Charles Brewer, Randy Smith, Steve Davis, Barney Bynes, Janet Matthews, and they were already officers of, of or admin officers of, of, of Division Two. It's also where I met for the first time Jay Allenon, Bill Hill, Drew Appleby, Ruth Alt, Tom Pusateri, Bill Addison. I mean, the list goes on and on and on. So as you can well imagine, sooner or later, they wrote me into uh, getting involved with, with, with Division Two, which I proved to be a, a wonderful decision on my part because I, uh, that again, proved to be something that really enhanced my growth as a, uh, as an academic and as a, as an instructor. So it all grew out of MacDoc in terms of getting involved with what we now call STP. All right. Where were we? Were you incubating, but so were you incubating ideas for intro psych? I, I've been told a couple of times a famous or infamous story. You and Ruth Alt having a conversation about themes and variations that comes out of MacTop? Yes. Yes, it did. It did. All right, let's. All right, I keep backtracking on you. I want to make sure we, we hit all the. the oh, they don't, it doesn't have to be well, in chronological order. Uh, all right, well, one thing I wanted to mention, you, you, you inquired about the research, and I did have quite finished. Right. That was an, an, another surprise. And so, that 1988 article, what we did mm -hmm. is I was at the page and undergrads that I was working with. We, we looked at 43 textbooks, we looked at like 29 objective features of those textbooks. Some were simple, like, you know, how many authors it has. Or, what edition it's in and stuff like that. Others really require a lot of cal painstaking calculation. You know, how many references per chapter? What is, what is the overall recency of those references? We even calculated manuscript length in words. It's page such a good indicator of, of the length of a book. Mm -hmm. And and then we use those to predict professors' perceptions of those 43 books in terms of how, what level they were, how scholarly they were, past to engage student interest, stuff like that. And so that, I began that back in like 85, 86. It didn't come out until 88, but that ended up triggering apparently a cascade of research of, of that ill. Yeah, which, I, uh, got, I got one of those in there in 93. And I hope I'm quoting it reasonably accurately. Years later, I was talking to Rich Griggs and, and he, he said that 88 article is what, what got him going. He said, I looked at your 88 article and I saw... 40 or 50 future articles, which he proceeded to crank out. So he, he single-handedly almost turned it into a, a whole line of research. So I, I did not see that coming, but, uh, so that, but it was all, it was not really motivated by, I'm trying to figure out what I'm going to do with my next book. I mean, it was, right. it was sort of relevant, but I didn't really think I'd come up with anything that practical. And to be honest, I didn't. It was more just the, the geek in me wanting to know about what seems to work for textbooks, but, but it, or what affects for, you know, it should, it should have yielded more useful information, but it, it, it didn't really. Well, but wait, and also hearing you tell your story about how you fanboy out about textbooks, that puts it all in context. I mean, 
this research gave me an excuse to gather 43 books together. <laughs> I mean, I mean, that really kind of puts it into context. Yeah, it, it did allow me to get the most recent edition of everything. Right. You're writing to all these publishers. May I, may I please, may I please have your most recent edition of all your intro psych tech all books? Of all, of all of them. They will not be returned. Sincerely, <laughs> Wayne White. Yeah. That was a little stealth theft, wasn't it? <laughs> it wasn't theft. Was not theft at all. You you told them what you were using it for. Yeah. And so, were you presenting that at MacTop? I presented it at APA. I don't remember if I presented that at MacTop. I don't know. May or may not have. Not sure. But oh, you mentioned the the, the chapter, the the history chapter that I did co-authored with Randall White. Yes. That that was fun. That was that was so much fun. That's huge. And Randall Randall really did the the hard work here. He did the early stuff, the first four decades or so. I would have known nothing about that stuff, but it was just fascinating to learn about the early texts written by John Dewey, William James, and Edward Titchener, and Woodworth, and Floyd Rue, and so forth. So that that was fun. That was a lot of fun. And so I got a kick out of that article. And I guess the comment I'd make on that one was I wish someone would go back and update that. Not only it was a history up through the 1980s, but we were so close to the 1980s, we really yeah. didn't know anything about the 1980s. So it really only goes up through the 1970s. So there's there's 50 years and that's gone by since then. And and so if there are any other fanboys out there who, who think that sounds intriguing, I think that's something that would be really interesting to, to look at. I actually know two guys who are working on updating that as we speak. No way. Yeah. Yeah, I don't. I don't mean to be coy, but you're talking to one of them. Yeah, we we, we should talk off microphone sometime. All right, that's cool. Yeah, you know the other one too. Great idea. I think it's time. I think it's time. Yeah, yeah. The other one's last name rhymes with Guru. I'll just say it that way. Oh, well, I, I have pretty good thoughts who the other one was. <laughs> yeah, we need a project from time to time. So. Oh yeah, right. I know you guys. Are... Well, we, we, we didn't went together. That, I mean, nothing going on. That's, that's the excuse. <laughs> so did, when you had, was it, when you identified themes and variations, had, because you've done the analysis, had you not seen that in intro psych texts before? Or how did that come about? Okay. No, no one was using that. No one was, was working with that. Although... That was not my initial plan for, for intro site. So after I did the adjustment book and that came out and it worked out really well, you know, that one was motivated basically by my complete dissatisfaction with what was out there. And I wanted, I thought I could build a better mousetrap. That wasn't true for intro and that was a different kind of motivation. I actually, you know, so I, I did the one book. It was clear that there was going to be another book in my future. The question was what? I went back and forth from social and intro. But I'm still, you know, in a community college environment, so you, you don't have the sort of the authority to, to write just any book. It's got to be something that's taught in your, in your realm. I keep interrupting you. How did you know it was clear there was going to be another book in your future? Well, just because I enjoyed it so much. Okay. I knew I'd write another one. <laughs> okay. All right. Oh, I, so in this case, it was more of uh, Brooks Cole came to me and, and, and there was, some back and forth about which way was better to go, but but the their editor for Intro Psych really wanted me to do the the intro book, and so here I can't look you in the eye and tell you that I thought I could build a better mousetrap, but I, I I guess I thought I could build a better one than Brooks Cole had, competing in the market. They're they're and, leaving. and they were they were eager for that. They had had a track record of of unsuccessful entries in in Intro Psych. Who was the editor? Do you remember who signed you? Oh. Absolutely remains a very close friend to this day. C. Deborah Lawton was her name, and oh, okay. she goes on. I, I don't, I, I don't think I knew her, but the name sounds familiar. Would Would she have attended MPAs back in the nineties? Oh yeah, yeah. Okay, yeah. that's probably where. And mm -hmm. yep. And you might not want to go here. What would have been the leading Brooks Cole book at the time that you aimed to replace? Well, they had Reitzman, but that hadn't worked out. They had a, a little bit of success with, with Le Francois, but then it, in the second edition, it, it, okay. it just did, had no legs. They had a book by John Ruck 
R-U-C-H. And actually, it was excellent. It was a superb book, but for some reason, it was a marketing failure that went, that went nowhere. That's, uh, that's not the same Rook as in Rook and Zimbardo, is it? No, no. Same spelling. But yeah, that, okay. That person was Floyd Rue, who hey, spelled it R-U-C-H. Thank you. Yeah. Yes, of course. Yeah. And he pioneered, he was the first person to write uh, uh, an introduction to psychology, tried, intentionally tried to make it interesting in 1937. I actually have one of those later editions that my older brothers used in college. I, I have a Rue and Zimbardo book. Wow. Where Zimbardo was not the first author yet. Treasure that. Because they, cool. they flipped at one point. They did in the in the sixties. They flipped. Oh my God! You, well, we're, we're retired by that. I mean, you uh, are a fanboy. Oh, I am. Sorry, I keep interrupting you. So, you you were talking about the research. I'm sorry. Yeah, the, and you were getting to themes and variations. I was getting to where the themes came from. So, so anyway, so we see Dad signed me to do an intro psych book for for Bird School. And of course, you have to cast around for some idea about what are you going to do that's going to be different, what's going to set your book apart. And what I came up with was something that had not been done previously that I thought was pretty intriguing, clever idea. And that was I wanted to write the first modular book, the first book with a modular organization that is breaking the chapters up into three or four or five self-contained modules, which of course has been become somewhat common in, in intro site. But at the time, there was no such thing. Unfortunately, I am three chapters into my intro site book when in 1986, out come two modular textbooks, thereby ruining my plans. Who are they uh, by? Jim Callett came out oh, with his intro Jay site. Jim Callett, yeah. Which was modular. I mean, it was, it was, they didn't make a massive deal about it, but it was a modular book. Yeah. And Rod Plotnick and McGraw Hill oh. came out with a modular book. They knew both those. Simultaneously, no less. The exact same year in 1986, just as I'd written three chapters in a modular format. And I'm going, oh, hell. <laughs> oh. Now what? Oh, at that point, I, I was like, really, wow, you know, I, uh, what the, I, I really was kind of flabbergasted. I didn't see that coming. Obviously, I guess I was sort of on the right track if other people were thinking that way. I mean, those books both have had good long runs, so uh, they, were, they were successful. So anyway, back to the drawing board. And I had no clue what I was going to do. I kept writing, but I had no clue what I was going to do in terms of coming up with a, a creative, different angle that would give the book. And I did it. And so I headed down in, night, in the fall of 1986 to, to the third MacTop. And, and God bless MacTop. That changed everything. They had a panel on the introductory course. Jill Palladino served as the moderator. I had to go, this is again why I, I, I wanted to do my homework before we sat down and talked. I mean, I had to go digging in my files. Would you believe I have the first, I have all the programs for the first eight MacTops, even though I didn't go to the first one. But I still have the programs for those first eight Mac tops. And otherwise, I wouldn't have been able to tell you who was on the, the panel. Sure. So forth. But, uh, the panel was moderated by Joe Palladino. And uh, the panelists were uh, Steve Davis, Randy Smith, Ruth Alt, and, and Drew Rapidly. Just sit and listen to y'all. And, and, and uh, it's getting towards the end of, of the, the, the time that was allocated to it. And it's, it's been interesting, but, but nothing breathtaking. And, and Ruth gets up and just as an aside, says something about Something to the effect that, you know, one problem I have or something I wish they'd change about intro site books. She didn't make a huge deal out of it. She said, you know, there's so much content and, it, and it's poured into these 16 or 18 or 20 buckets that seem unrelated. And I really lament the lack of any effort to come up with some, some themes to integrate all this disparate content. And I, I, she didn't hammer on it or anything. I mean, I think it was, you know, maybe a minute of her, her talk, but that light bulb clicked on immediately. And I thought, damn, she's right. She's absolutely right. No one has ever done anything with themes. And, and, and that would make sense. I mean, God, that would help students to, to 
be able to absorb the, the, or assimilate this, these massive quantities of information. If you, if you could, if you could tie it to, to, to some overarching ideas and, and it would allow you to pick things that you can like burn into their brains forevermore. I just went right away and oh God, that's so cool. I didn't say anything to Ruth because I had no idea, you know, whether I'd be able to, you know, a lot of times you have ideas that you think are good ideas. And then you go to execute them and it was all flat. Oh, yes. With the miserable failure. So I, I said nothing to Ruth until like two or three years later when, when the book was actually coming out, I think. But I decided to try and run with that. And so I, I, I pulled all my DePage back, fellow faculty in Sonic about, you know, what, what do you think the themes ought to be? I had no idea what the themes would be. <laughs> yeah, themes, that sounds good. What would they be? No, that's and, great. So I, and I pulled the, the page back a at first and I got some really good ideas from them. And then next the following year at Math Top, I pulled a much larger, more diverse audience to get some more insight to it. And, and then I, that allowed me to formulate my, my six themes that, that we launched with. And I eventually added seven with a couple of editions later. And Wayne, why I really appreciate that. First off, that origin story, it's, it, I just think it's great to have that recorded. I mean, I've heard it a couple of times, but it's great to have it recorded. And also, you know, here in 2022, you know, we've got this introductory psychology initiative and themes are part of that. It's been rolled out. And I think sometimes we get excited about the themes that they have rolled out. And I was part of that group. And I, I will tell you that I have been one of the voices that has continually said, you know, we've had themes in intro psych since the 1980s. This guy, Wayne Whiten, wrote a book starting with themes and variations in the 1980s. So I'm glad to give credit to you and to have the story in your own voice. Well, I, yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm thrilled to, to repeat the story and, and, and highlight once again for what I hope is a larger audience that it's Ruth Alt's vision. I mean, it's, it's, it's as far as we have themes now in the AI. I mean, it, it's it's Ruth that that had that. that it it might terrible. have been the initial kernel, but but Ruth didn't run with it, and we both adore Ruth. Let's be clear on this. But Ruth didn't run with it and write the book and then revise it ten times to make it one of the leading introductory psychology textbooks in the English speaking world that we both know that it is and. You're too humble to say anything about that, so I'll just move along. No, I couldn't do it without her. Couldn't have done it with her. Okay. It made a big difference. It did. It did. Absolutely. I know I've kept you long. There's just a couple of things I before I let you go, I really would love to ask you about. And there's there's a, there's a there's one untold story that I really want you to tell, if you will. Is there anything left? To, la, any last thoughts that you have about that? About that textbook and what it's meant for you. Any any takeaways that you want to mention about your intro psych textbook? Well, I think it's a very interesting story about the the illustration program. Okay, please. I do. I mean, in terms of, of it, you know, having enjoyed some success, I think the themes were a big part of giving it an identity. But I think just as important was we really did break new ground in terms of the the illustration program. And, and a lot of the credit for that goes to the editor again, C. Deborah Lott, put together an amazing production team. I don't know, you're, you're probably not old enough to remember the Psych Today textbook, but I have it. I never used it as a textbook or taught out of it, but I, ha I have some of the editions. Well, Psych Today came out in 69, and it was a, an instant, massive hit. And what made it a massive hit was its illustration program, which was extraordinarily innovative, not always pedagogically sound. They worked more to be pretty than, than to, to get points across effectively, but it was, it, it became the best seller instantly and, and continued. It, it, the problem with it was it, it didn't have an author. It, had, it was one of these managed books right. and, and uh, had very uneven content and, and the illustration program, although exciting was, was not, again, not well thought out pedagogically. But anyway, th this ended up working in, in my favor. The, the Psych Today book was created in Del Mar, California by a small startup publisher called CRM. Right. Yeah, yeah. And, and they were bought out by Random House, who 
absconded with the book to New York, stranding all these creative types in Del Mar with no textbook to work on. And so my, my editor, C. Deb, somehow was, was aware of all that. And so when it came time to do my, my book, I had said to her, look, I really want to want to work on, I, I really want to break new ground with the illustration program. And I explained to her what I wanted to do with it. And she said, I know where to find the people who do this. If we just, you know, make sure that we concentrate more on the, the educational soundness, as well as creating a book that is, is visually stunning. So she went down to, to Del Mar and, and recruited all of these, these incredible creative types. And I had the incredible good fortune to work with the people who created the site today illustration program. Only we did it differently this time. I mean, we really worked more on, on its educational value. And, and that made a big difference to me because the thing is with a, a textbook, you know, especially when the 50 intro textbooks out there, people just kind of thumb through it. And so if you see an illustration program that looks unlike anything you've ever seen before. And of course, nowadays you go back and look at the 1989 version, it looks like what they all look like. But, but at that time, that wasn't the case. They were, they were a lot of dense black print and. And what, when they had illustrations, they weren't put together by the authors. The authors had no input on that stuff. Right. They just slide together any old garbage and half the time it was misleading, inaccurate. They missed all sorts of opportunities to, to enhance students' understanding of things by creating diagrams from scratch. And uh, so I, I thought that the illustration program is also a big part of the books being successful. And it too has kind of a weird story behind it. I mean, you know, go figure that we could look up with the CRM team, which was uh, incredibly creative. Well, I just remember it being such, you know, I started teaching in 92 and it was such a competitive time that you would look for any advantage, whether it was the illustration program or, you know, the, the ancillaries or the, the level of service that the textbook rep was going to provide. It was a real competitive mm -hmm. advantage. And so, you know, once you had the book, then knowing that the features were pedagogically sound really did make a difference. You know, it was getting the adoption, then keeping the adoption, right? There's two separate processes. We're really yeah. doing fair. They still are, but but it, it feels different somehow these days. They are different these days. One last tidbit about intro book coming out in 89. Can I see my first letter of congratulation here? I, I, I'll, David Myers. Yep. Does he do that with everybody? Well, I don't know. I don't have an hey, intro right. book, but, but yeah. And I, 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 I swear, okay, not been out three months and I get a letter and we, David and I had not met at that point, but I get a letter from Dave Myers, a lengthy letter going on and on and on about how much he likes all this, this, and that about the book. And, and so what a gentleman. Now I can't rule out the possibility he does that with everybody because it's that nice. But, uh, I, but yeah, I think like you, he is genuinely that nice. And, and I don't know if he sends it to everybody either. I have no idea, but, and I suspect that in your very rare air of intros of highly successful intro psych textbook authors, maybe others looking from the outside in think you're competing against each other. My guess is that you're competing against your last editions that you're revising up to the next edition. I mean, you've got your brand, you're in your 10th, 11th, 12th edition. You've got your briefer, you've got your modules, you've got your loose leaf, you've got your Canadian edition, you've got 42 different versions and so does he. You're probably not competing against him well, per se. Or is that wrong? addressing the point? Yeah, I mean, here's, here's the thing. The market is big enough to have lots of people be successful. And, and so you don't have, need to think about it as a competition. Right, and right. Part, most of us do not. I mean, so I, I've got a lot of it, it, you know, intro authors numbered among close friends. And and, uh, and we, we just, yeah, yeah we don't not that way. Yeah. That's, there's we're, we're way to have success. Yeah. Sue France and I organized, oh, a number of years ago at some of the regionals. Whoever was going to be there, we'd put intro psych authors together in a symposium from different publishers and right. just have an open forum. Because people are like like myself curious about the process, and and mm -hmm. it'd be really cool to see you know four different intro psych authors or co-authors from four different publishers, and you know you could see that many of them were friends, and they knew each other's books. 
not in a competitive cutthroat way, but in a friendly, oh yeah, I really love what you did in your chapter six. I wish I could get my people to do that. I mean, it was, it was admirational. It wasn't mm -hmm. confrontational. No, not at all. Not at all. Yeah. Which is a really cool thing. I think about most teachers of psychology. Well, we all appreciate what each of us has to go through to even pull this off. I mean, it is a pretty massive undertaking and, and staying on top of things is, is, you know, big commitment. And so we appreciate how hard everybody, each, you know, each of us has to work at it. Absolutely. And I've, I've never heard any, any, anybody say anything bad about a fellow. No, there, that might think of. there's no reason to Wayne. I've almost kept you an hour and a half and. There's, there's one topic I want to bring up and I apologize right now because it's going to make you uncomfortable because it involves praising you. And I'm sorry. I apologize. Praising you, I can tell, makes you uncomfortable. The Society for the Teaching of Psychology, APA Division II, STP, has benefited greatly from your negotiating skills. Now, when you get a chance to tell your part of the story, you're going to say that you were just one of many in the room and, and you just did your part and you're going to, do, you're going to do the thing that I've listened to you do for the past hour and 26 minutes. And because you're, you're very kind about this, but as a successful author of two leading books and who knows how many other contracts you have contractual negotiation skills that not many other rank and file faculty members have. I'm not even going to wait for you to agree with that because I know it to be true. So I don't know, 10, 15 years ago, teach the journal for STP is teaching of psychology. I believe it, it's contract ended with Taylor and Francis. It was going out to bid. Am I right so far about that part? Well, you jumped ahead a little bit. Taylor and Sorry. Francis would be the second negotiation. All right. So the the cut. So for decades, including some of the decades I was part of STP early on, STP was a like many other academic organizations, cash poor. I remember hearing Charles uh, Charles Brewer tell stories about they would gather at APA at the national convention and pass the hat to pay for the breakfast that morning, which was, you know, stale bagels and orange juice. I mean, it was that is, that's absolutely accurate. And that is not an apocryphal story that happened for years on end because the hotels, you know, APA stays in nice hotels. If you order breakfast from the hotel, it would have cost 50% of our annual budget or something. <laughs> so, so STP for the longest time was cash poor, didn't, didn't, you know, operated on a shoestring, te like teachers really? often do. And I don't remember what year it was, but I, I, I think I was secretary of STP at the time. So this is the only reason why I knew a little bit of what was going on. And the contract to publish teaching of psychology was up with the current publisher and it went, there was a bidding negotiation process and you were part of the team of people who helped represent STP in negotiating the next 10 year contract. Mm -hmm. Is that fairly accurate? Okay. Everything is accurate. All right. It leaves out some stuff that can't came before, but it's, it's all accurate. All right. Thank you. And here's the thing. One of the main reasons why STP has the programming, the support, the grant program, the instructional resource grants, why they can support stipends and buyouts for officers and committee members, why STP has over a million dollars in their bank account right now is because people like Wayne Whiten and maybe a couple others who were with him in the room that day negotiated a 10, the first time it was a 10 year deal with, it was, was it Sage? Uh, Sage is who we currently with. Yes. W was the first 10 years, Taylor and Francis? We, we originally were with Lawrence Earl Baum and Associates up until 97. That was the first opportunity to have a renegotiation. 
we ended up re-signing with them, but then Larry retired and, and sold his company to Taylor and Francis. And so they finished that, that tenure. And so the next opportunity then renegotiate is 2010. But every, every, every person who's ever told me this story was, it's because of your savvy in that room. I believe the first time it was a 10 year payout from the publisher to STP of $140,000 a year for 10 years, 1.4 mil. And then when it was re-upped, the next 10-year contract was $170,000 a year for 10 years, 1.7 mil. And maybe the numbers aren't that important other than your savvy, your generosity in negotiating that and having that experience that you brought to that table has given STP financial security that it never experienced in its 75 year history up until those points in time. Okay. Are you ready to hear the story of the unsung hero in this? In this as long as long, first of all, y- yes. And hopefully you'll take the due credit you're deserved. I will take some, but uh, I've, I've been given too much as, as is often the case. All right. To, to put it, uh, to give you exact numbers, because I, I know you were going to ask about this. So I looked it up. In the 90s, we were, you know, Hurlbaum gave us just a standard contract. It's, it's not their job to give us a lucrative contract. It's our job to, to negotiate it. That's one of the things I learned from Claire Verdoyne. And uh, Larry was a great guy, but it was not a favorable contract. So we were losing about 20000 a year in the 1990s on our journey, which chewed up a lot of the money that came in as, 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 as dues. The first negotiation was 1997. And in order to, to conduct an effective, I was asked to, to do the negotiation, Randy and I, Randy Smith, sure. and I were put in charge of it. And I thought, well, God, I don't know anything about this, but I may know someone who does. And so I went to my former intro editor, C. Deborah Lawton, and she had moved from not long after my book, actually right around the time my book came out, she, her husband took a job in LA. She moved to Sage in the LA area. So she was at Sage. And so at Sage, you work on journals as well as books. So I went to her and she coached me on how to go about, you know, looking at other publishers and so forth. And, but what she really did that was important was she wanted to sign it for Sage. She was very familiar with it. Back in her days as an intro editor, she read T.O.P. She had a huge respect for T.O.P. And so she wanted T.O.P. for Sage back in 97. And, uh, and I went, of course, to, to Larry Earlbaum and asked him, you know, how they could sweeten the deal. And Larry was very smart, very crafty. Oh, I love Larry. I absolutely love him. He, he, he published us when no one else was interested. I mean, he became a great friend to the organization. But he said, well, you know what? Rather than, you know, my coming up with an offer, how about if you just allow me to match whatever you think your best author is? Offer is. And so in 1997, CDAB put in a really aggressive offer on behalf of, of the Sage. And I didn't think Larry would match it because it was going to be a big turnaround for him financially, but he matched it. And, and again, this is me being naive. He could have given me some way more, I now know. <laughs> but that's where we had the first turnaround. So 1997, up until then, we were dirt, dirt poor. And was it about 140 grand a year? For 10 years? Not that, no, not that, that was not that big a jump, but it was a huge jump to us. Instead of losing 20000 a year, we were making 40000 a year. So that was a $60,000 turnaround. Okay. Which all of a sudden we could buy breakfast at the, at the hotel and we could right. fund a lot. Of and the money. organization started to bank money. They started to mm-hmm. have reserves. Yes, yes. So Larry then eventually retired. We were not real happy with, he sold to Taylor and Francis. We were not real, and not, not me so much, the editors, you know, Randy and, and Drew didn't feel like they got the attention that, that, that they, the journals should merit. There were some fulfillment problems. And so next time our, our contract was up and now with Taylor and Francis, we decided to renegotiate. And who do I go to again? C. Deb has now moved on to Guilford. <laughs> This time we decided to do a full fledged 10 page request or proposals. Who do you think showed me how to craft that? C. Deb sent me two of her best RFPs she had ever seen with all the names, you know, blocked out. And that's what allowed me to put together this, this 
you know, document that touted the, the, the society, touted the journal and all that. And, and that's what we sent out to the various publishers in 2010. And we sent out six publishers. Um, one, the big, I'm blanking on their name, passed, but the other five all came in with, with really nice offers. And, uh, and ironically, her former employee, employer Sage, was the one that came in with me with the best overall author and has proven to be a wonderful, wonderful partner for us. And, and yeah, that's the one that came in at like 140,000 annually. Oh, and, then able to ask for it. and even at the last one, I wasn't involved, but, but Ken Keith reached out and asked me, you know, how does the environment look? Do you think we can, you know, are we going to have to give back? How can we do better? Whatever. And who did I reach out to again? But Steve who comes back in a week and fills me in on, on how things are looking. And, and that's the basis for the advice that I, I provided to, to Ken at that time. So the unsung hero is my former intro editor who I, I, so I, I, I don't know. And I have great negotiating skills. I, I do a lot of homework, but I, I, I've gotten way more credit than I deserve for this. The real, the real person who's, who, you know, is responsible is for our financial solvency is, is, has been heretofore unknown. Well, and I, I just really feel like I needed to correct the record on this. It, it's, it's, it's needed. If, if we were a university, I'd argue we should put her name on a building. I mean, well, first off, I'm right. glad you've had the chance to correct the record because that's always a good thing. And I believe I predicted that you would deflect the, the credit. And I, I was right. Not too well, when your predictions come true. I, I do. I, I, re I really do, Wayne. And, and, you know, but of course, you know, that it's only because, you know, you knew who to ask and who to consult with, and you had the connection that STP got the benefit from that. So you can deflect all you want. And I am so sorry. This makes you uncomfortable. I am, I'm being sincere, but it, no, I'm not that uncomfortable, but I really, but really people have, 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 have assumed I have abilities. I don't have, well, they really but, have. but you do have abilities. You had the connections to know who to ask. I mean, I, I, I don't know about you, but I see this as the theme throughout your life, right? You, you didn't really know how to go to college, but you figured it out and you knew how to ask. You didn't know how to get into grad school, but you knew how to figure it out and knew to ask. I mean, it really hasn't stopped you from doing anything. You didn't know how to write an intro, an adjustment textbook, but you knew how, who to ask and where to look it up and figured it out. I mean, you've always figured it out your whole life. It strikes me. Anyway. I'm not, not going to hark you. What's that? I'm not going to argue with you. I don't know. I mean, I, I just, well, you, you can argue all you want. You're probably right. Are there, I I've kept you so long. Any other contributions about STP that you want to mention? Any, anything else? I'll let you wrap it up. I'll try to let you have the last word other than thanking you at the very end. There's just one other thing that I, uh, I maybe we should let it go with that. I feel like this has already been too, too congratulatory. Uh, I just, here's the thing. I'm going to wrap things up. I'm going to say I am, I feel incredibly, incredibly privileged to be able to serve in the role that I've served in chronicling the progress that we've had in psychology for over 40 years now. I mean, that is a privilege. And, and the fact that the books have done well enough for me to continue with that privilege has, has been just a, a, a marvelous, marvelous outcome for me. And uh, I am you know, so happy with all the progress I've seen. Well, I'm, I'm not the spokesperson for the teaching of psychology, but the gifts that you've given have been gifts well received, not only by students in our classrooms, but by teachers taking techniques from you that, or by indirect support that you provided to STP as well as Rocky Mountain Psychological Association and serving as its president and so many other things that we didn't mention. So, Wayne, thank you for all you've done. And especially thank you for spending almost two hours with me tonight. I really appreciate it. And I think our listeners are going to appreciate a little bit deeper dive into you and your background. 
Well, thank you for having me. Thank you for inviting me. And thank you for, you know, this, this works both ways. Thank you for all you do. I mean, my God, you helped found a, a journal that is going to be shaping our discipline for, for decades to come. So this, this works both ways. This is yeah. what people do. They spin it around when they're on, <laughs> receiving compliments. <laughs> and, and the podcast series. I mean, that's a fabulous contribution. So thank you, Wayne.